molecular orbital theory. This is a more robust way of looking at the structure of molecules and we actually use it quite a bit in inorganic chemistry. So it applies to organic chemistry but we could also apply it to inorganic chemistry. And it's not the you know last word on uh, molecular structure. There's a lot more advanced and sophisticated uh, theories that give you even more detailed information about molecules. But this is actually not too difficult of an approach and at the same time it gives you a little bit more information about the molecules which you know helps out. So in the case of a molecule like hydrogen fluoride, uh, what we see right here is the energies in Rydbergs for hydrogen and fluorine, basically the second row elements. And what you basically see is that the p orbitals depicted by the green triangles are kind of close in energy to the s orbital of hydrogen. The s orbitals of fluorine, on the other hand, are very down in energy, very far below. And so what ends up happening is that in molecular orbital theory, orbitals of the same symmetry can combine with each other to give you bonding orbitals and anti-bonding orbitals. Um, orbitals of incongruent symmetry don't mix. In the case of the p orbitals, uh, the p orbital going up and down cannot really mix with that s orbital and the one going in and out also cannot mix so they remain untouched but the orbital is going sideways you know left and right that can definitely mix with the s orbital by forming a sigma bond and so what we see is that we form that sigma bond between the p orbital and the s orbital as well as the anti-bonding um, orbital which is the the one where the shading areas do not match now, at the same time, the s orbital of the f uh, atom does to some degree interact with the s orbital of the hydrogen, but because the energies are so different from each other, the interaction is very minimal. So, to a first approximation, we could just say, okay, that 2s orbital of the fluorine will remain relatively untouched. And then simply what you do is you bring in the electrons. There's one electron for the hydrogen, there is seven for the fluorine, so you have eight altogether. So you pump in two in the first set, another two on the sigma, and then we have two levels right here. Each one of them can take up two electrons. So we can fill up eight electrons up until that point. And what this basically tells you is that you have your outermost electrons are the ones present in the p orbitals of the f element, and, and they're not actually combined. So they are very much associated with the fluorine atom only, telling you that these are really the lone pairs of fluorine. Notice that one of those electrons is actually interacting with the um, hydrogen orbital. But the last set right here is also very unique to the fluorine, even though you know it's the most symmetrical out of all the interactions. All right, now um, you could also have a more complicated case like carbon, di carbon monoxide right here. Well, you do have s and p orbitals for both the left element and the right element making up the bond and so here i've just gone ahead and drawn out the the overall structure for uh, this molecular diagram and uh, carbon has four electrons four balance electrons oxygen has six so that's 10 balance electrons that we need to fill in into the, the into the molecular diagram so we place two on the bottom orbital two more on the next one we can fill in four on the pi and we can add the final two to the sigma right here and that fills up the entire set of 10 valence electrons and um, the one thing that is important about this type of structure so I'm, we're not going to get to that level of detail in this class so don't don't get too uh, concerned about it uh, but one thing that I want to point out is that there is something known as frontier orbitals and specifically these are the orbitals corresponding to the highest orbital that has electrons on it and the next orbital that doesn't have any electrons on it. So in the case of HF, we have the electrons on the P orbital of the fluorine atom and the sigma star orbital that doesn't have any electrons. And for carbon monoxide, we have the last set of electrons on this sigma orbital and the pi star segment that doesn't have any electrons. 
Now, the significance of these orbitals is that the highest occupied molecular orbital, the one that has electrons on it, contains the electrons of highest energy, and these are the most reactive electrons in the molecule. So if your molecule behaves as a base, it will do so with the electrons of the highest energy orbital. And on the other hand, if your molecule behaves as an acid, it will accept electrons on the lowest orbital that doesn't contain electrons, meaning your sigma star orbital for HF, which is mostly residing on the hydrogen atom, which explains why you give away H's for acids in the case of HF, or the pi star, which is actually an anti-bonding pi system for the carbon monoxide uh, fragment. And this actually explains why carbon monoxide um, behaves as a poisonous gas, because it binds really good to transition metals as a result of that pi star anti-bonding um, acidic orbital. So they tend to explain the reactivity of molecules. So with that idea in mind, we have lone pairs. And lone pairs tend to be where the highest molecular orbitals are present. So we're actually going to have a lot of molecules or elements that are going to use the lone pairs to attack centers that have a partial positive charge or are developing a partial positive charge or may even have a full-on positive charge for that matter. So molecules with lone pairs like oxygen-containing molecules, sulfur, nitrogen, those are molecules that can definitely attack carbon that bears a slight positive charge with those lone pairs. Um, so the lone pairs can definitely act as the highest occupied molecular orbitals or homos of the molecule. But in some molecules, you might not actually have lone pairs, in which case, if the molecule is to behave as a base, it will have to do so through its bonds. So CH bonds and CC bonds can actually behave as bases if there's nothing else better in your mixture to you know, act as a base. Um, and we'll see some, some of those cases um, in the future. But this is only in the absence of lone pairs. Now the LUMOS are basically, um, are gonna be carbon fragments and we're gonna be for the most part, not always, but for the most part, we're going to be concentrating on that carbon element. And what's going to give it away is the fact that the carbon is going to be bound to an electronegative element like fluorine or better yet, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Uh, that will create a LUMO that is lower enough in energy that can accept electrons. And so that becomes uh, your point of attack. So you could have a carbon nitrogen bond, carbon oxygen, carbon sulfur or your carbon halogen bonds that create that LUMO orbital. Um, but also it needs to be said that if you do have hydrogen bonds to electronegative elements like nitrogen, oxygen, the halogens, you know, sulfur, the hydrogen can be the thing you attack with a HOMO, right? Because that becomes the acidic portion. So it's something to keep in mind that we're going to ultimately look into in future lectures. But the LUMOS are the reactive part of the molecule if the molecule behaves as an acid. The HOMO is the most reactive part of the molecule if it behaves as a base. And the thing to really be on the lookout for are those lone pairs of electrons, um, single bonds, as we'll find out later on in the class, even double and triple bonds can be the HOMOs in your reaction. And triple bonds and double bonds are more reactive than single bonds. So single bonds are your last resort. All right, so um, speaking of multiple bonds, right? We have your pi bonds that make up uh, either the second line or the second and third lines in your multiple bonds. Um, and this is in the absence of lone pairs once again. And they can attack LUMOS, um, which also bear that uh, pi orbital, in this case, a pi star segment. So they can attack other um alkenes other alkynes that have that double triple bond character associated with it 
but you could also have more electronegative elements bound to it, which also render that carbon a little bit more reactive as a result of the electronegativity difference. Same thing here with this carbon oxygen double bond. You make that carbon a little bit more um, electrodeficient, a little bit more uh, positively charged, you make it more likely that um, molecules that are electron rich, like double bonds or triple bonds, may attack that carbon. All right, so in terms of reactivity, the Homo Lumo uh, basically tells you that, yes, you're going to react those two things. It's kind of like the idea of reacting the acid plus the base yielding products. Same thing here, Homo plus Lumo yields products. And when you look at a set of reactants, like the molecule right here containing your oxygen, um, hydrogen bond, uh, which by the way, that oxygen is bound to a carbon. I'm using the R symbol to represent any type of carbon shape. Because uh, carbon, as I mentioned earlier on, um, has a lot of diverse uh, morphology. It can really take up on many different shapes, many different structures. Um, so basically, this stands for some sort of carbon bound to that oxygen. And then we have this carbon chlorine bond. Um, now, the oxygen bears that lone pair. And the carbon with the chlorine can create that LUMO. So what this is telling you is that the home of the oxygen can attack the lumo of the carbon. Since that carbon had already a full octet, it has to let go of two electrons. And the electrons that's going to let go are the electrons making up that lumo bond. In other words, electrons of the chlorine, which will be given directly to the chlorine. That's breaking that bond. In the process, you make this intermediate molecule that still has that oxygen bound to the hydrogen, bound to the carbon, but now it's bound to that additional CH3 fragment. And since that oxygen had no charge, it gave its electrons. Now it has a plus one charge. The chlorine was neutral. It accepted electrons. So now it has that minus one charge. Do not confuse this for a resonance structure. It is not a resonance structure for the mere fact that we have broken up a connectivity and we have added another connectivity that wasn't there. In resonance structures, you would always have connectivity within the same elements and the same atoms. But when you break a connectivity altogether or make a new connectivity where there was none, you're not dealing with that resonance structure, you're dealing with that reaction. All right, now, um, this intermediate that contains that oxygen with a positive charge, that makes the oxygen uh, molecule rather reactive. In particular, it makes the hydrogen that it's bound to very acidic because the electrons of that bond are going to go towards the oxygen, which is more electronegative. And since now you have a positive charge on that oxygen, you really are pulling the electrons away from the hydrogen. So the chloride that you just form is your new HOMO, and that attacks the LUMO of that OH bond, ultimately creating a new bond between the chlorine and the hydrogen while breaking the OH bond. And those electrons go back to that oxygen. So this is what we call a mechanism, but it's a mechanism from, you know, utilizing this idea of homos and lumos. And in due time, we're going to talk about acid and bases from the point, from the point of view of pKa's to kind of add a little bit more, um, more ground to this idea of reactivity. But be on the lookout for those lone pairs. Be ready to recognize those. Um, reactive carbon X bonds where you have an electronegative element bound to carbon because that will basically tell you electrons are going to attack that carbon center and the carbon center that's being attacked by electrons is going to have to break a bond in the process if it already contains a full octet. Um, the second thing and probably last thing that I want to mention is that notice how I'm drawing these arrows. I always start, the tail of the arrow always starts at the lone pair and it always ends at an element. The one thing I don't want you to do is to have the arrow pointing at the lone pair and starting at the atom. That is totally incorrect and you will get marked down for that. Make sure that you start at electrons and you end up at atoms. All right, I'll give you one more example of uh, how this frontier orbital uh, business is important. Um, we could also look at structures of molecules. So these two are the same structures, but notice that on the left structure, we have the OH bond pointing up and to the right and the CH bond pointing down. Whereas right here, the CH bond is pointing up and to the right and the OH bond is pointing down. Now, uh, what we could do is use homo-lumo um, interactions to tell which of these two um, 
conformations is more stable than the other. And in particular, we pay attention to that carbon-oxygen bond, which has a potential LUMO associated with it. And notice that this is going kind of up and to the right, but also down and to the left. So that's the direction of the LUMO. And over here, the carbon-oxygen bond is going up and down. So that's literally the direction of the LUMO. Now, in conjunction with that, notice that the next door atom, the oxygen here, has a lone pair pointing straight up, and that is lined up perfectly with this LUMO. So it kind of creates a favor homo-LUMO interaction, whereas that cannot be done here because there is um, an orthogonal relationship between the LUMO and the homo. And the other lone pair right here is not exactly pointing in the same directions. So it's, it's, it's not exactly like lining up all that well. So you could also use this type of arguments, also known as stereoelectronic arguments, to determine why certain structures are going to be favored over others. In any case, that's all I have to say in respect to molecular orbital theory. So I'll see you in the next video.